Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel. Today we are picking up on a series which is the Divination in Depth series with um, kind of a detour and I would apologize but I'm not gonna because I'm actually talking about something that I really enjoy talking about so I'm just gonna say no apologies. Anyway, uh, today I am talking about the history of the card that we currently call the High Priestess. I'm going to be going rather in depth on it, in particular through the medieval period and the Middle Ages. There will also eventually be a video where I go into the various schools of interpretation on the High Priestess, the way the card has looked through the ages. And, um, and my current interpretation of the card, like normal with the Tarot in Depth series. But I realized that I had this really long section that I'd written up um, while trying to answer a question for myself that was going to make any video that went into all of that enormous, just really, really long. So that will be a separate video. And this one is just going to be going into the information that I just said I was looking into myself. So what is that information? And the question is, what exactly originally inspired the Papis or Popis card? Because what we call the High Priestess wasn't originally a High Priestess card at all. That's really a modern reinterpretation. I have a whole nother series that is ready to be filmed and I just need to get around to it, which is the timeline of the history of the tarot. If you've been on our channel for a while, you know I actually reported it at one point, had it up, and then decided I wanted to go even more in depth, did the research, and I now have a 188 page timeline of the history of the tarot. Um, but it goes into how there's actually an incredibly large amount of Christian symbolism in the deck, especially in its original form, that it's actually based in the Neoplatonic movement and the Christianity of the Antiquity and the Middle Ages. And that a lot of the reason why people insist that it's actually this super ancient occult mystic symbolism is because the deck was reimagined, um, not because that symbolism is original to the deck. Sorry. Um, I know I always get hate comments when I talk about the mythic history of the tarot versus the real history of the tarot. Oh well, I guess this is a major part of what makes me enjoy being a historian, not the hate comments, the research. And I'm gonna share it anyway, even though I get the hate comments. But I digress. Let's get into it, um, and uh, please remember to like and subscribe, and to outweigh some of those hate comments, leave me a positive one. Maybe? I don't know. I'd appreciate it. Okay. I apologize for the change in lighting. I opened my laptop, so by the magic of needing my notes, I suddenly look really different, but that's okay. All right, so let's get into this debate. Some modern tarot readers hold up the High Priestess as evidence of an ancient non-Christian religion that inspired the imagery of the deck. However, uh, it is far, far more likely that the High Priestess started out as an allegory of one of the powers associated with Christianity itself. Um, there are allegorical virtues that are really, really common as personifications in the artwork of the medieval era. Now, when we get into um, the next video on the High Priestess, I will go into all of the various medieval art that probably inspired the High Priestess as we see it today. Um, I'm not going to get into all of that right now because 
I really want to focus on one particular debate. So the debate is, let's say that this isn't an allegory, that this isn't the personification of one of the allegories. So this isn't prudence. This isn't an allegory of the church itself. This isn't um, sapentia. Uh, this isn't wisdom. This is what if this card was inspired by a real person. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm going to be getting into the debate as to whether or not this card is actually liberty, prudence, um, or any other allegorical virtue, and how that actually attaches to the Italian history of the Wild Hunt next time. Right now, I want to talk about whether the card could have been inspired by one of three actual historical figures and the evidence for and against each one. Now, before you write me and you say, hey, I think it was absolutely this one and I want to know why you didn't say which one you think it is. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I see the evidence for and against all of these. I have one that I think is slightly more likely in that there's a little more evidence to support it, but I wasn't there. Um, so I'm going to present all of the arguments that I found for and against. Um, as always, my sources are available. I'm going to warn you, they're long in this particular case, and you're welcome to them if you want them. Additionally, our patrons did actually receive these notes um, with all of the images and the like. Uh, and our patrons at the $30 and up level will eventually get the full High Priestess book. So keep that in mind. You can find the link to our Patreon below the video. Right, let's get into it. Some tarot historians claim that the Popus or Papus is a representative of the legend of Pope Joan. So what's the legend of Pope Joan? The story of Pope Joan was extremely popular among German monks throughout the High Middle Ages, and it spread from that region to gain popularity through the entirety of Christendom during the Protestant Reformation. Pope Joan, um, circa 9th century CE, was an English woman who was extremely erudite, wise, talented. She disguised herself as a man and worked within the bounds of the church. Some versions of the story say that she did so at the behest of a male lover. Others claim that she did so in order to pursue her own goals and exercise her own talents and capabilities. Regardless, in all accounts, she was so extremely intelligent and valuable that she rose through the church ranks and eventually became an elected pope. Her designated sex at birth was revealed when she suddenly gave birth during a church procession. In some versions of the story, she died naturally in childbirth to the great shock and horror of the witnessing crowd. In others, they were so incensed at having been deceived as to her designated sex at birth that they killed her, um, either by dragging her behind a horse or by stoning her. So, the accounts often claim that later church processions avoided the spot of her death or murder and that the Vatican eradicated all mention of a female pope from its official lists. Supposedly, the Vatican also created a ritual via which to establish the genitalia of those elected pope in order to ensure that someone who was designated female at birth was never given an opportunity to be pope again. Um, so, is the story of Pope Joan real or a legend? And did it potentially inspire this particular card. Could this 
have been based on an actual historical event. Some historians of the 19th century say that this is pure legend due to the fact that her papacy could not fit into any known interval in recorded papal history according to the dates used in the papal accounts. The medieval accounts are pretty well documented. Others claim that the account is based on real historical events. These historians claim that the records of Pope Joan were intentionally altered or destroyed. There have been many manipulations of medieval texts and records in the past, especially regarding topics of strong ideological dispute, and especially regarding who has power in the church. Although the evidence of omission or alteration would be difficult to find, it can be argued that a lack of evidence does not prove a lack of existence, Absence of evidence is not actually evidence of absence. Another issue with reliance only on written records is that much of what we know of early medieval history and antiquity comes from oral accounts. The oral history of the papacy is full of contradictory narratives as it is, and how much was included and how much was altered, removed, etc. when the latter was written down is a matter of debate. We know that many, many stories were preserved through only oral accounts, as the majority of European medieval persons were illiterate. It is possible that the story of Pope Joan is based on a much earlier historical account from before the well-kept papal records, and that the time given in the later written down versions of those oral accounts is what is inaccurate. Note, this is a less widely defended theory. Generally, historians claim that Pope Joan either didn't exist at all, or that the records were altered, not that Pope Joan existed before the records were written. It has also been noted that there is no written record of a female pope in the records of the enemies of the papacy in the 9th century. For example, Photius I of Constantinople, circa 1810 to 1820 CE to 1893 CE, who became the Patriarch of Constantinople in 858 CE and was deposed by Pope Nicholas I, um, who lived from circa 800 to 867 CE, in 863 CE, never made any mention of a female Pope, despite the fact that he vehemently asserted his own authority as Patriarch over that of the Pope in Rome. He almost certainly would have made a rather large deal about any kind of scandal in the papacy, and he never mentioned the story in all of his many, many writings. So if one of the popes had died giving birth in public, that probably would have made it into his rather scathing writings about the papacy, and it didn't. Rosemary and Daryl Pardo, the authors of The Female Pope, The Mystery of Pope Joan, actually placed the plausible time period for a female pope between 1086 CE and 1108 CE, during a time period where there were several anti-popes. So basically the theory here is there were several popes, so it's actually possible that Pope Joan was one of them. This actually agrees with the earliest known version of the legend by Jan Kierer of Mai, as he places the story in the year 1099 CE. Jan Kierer of Mai, also called Jan de Mai, uh, who lived in the mid-13th century, was a Dominican chronicler working in Metz, who recorded the first written record of Pope Joan in his Latin chronicle of the Diocese of Metz, the Chronica Universalis Metensis, written in approximately 1250 CE, it contains the first mention of an unnamed female pope. In his recorded account, which records events as occurring in 1099 CE, the female pope is not named. The content of the text is as follows. It is required confirmation about a certain pope, or rather a popus, since he was a woman. Pretending to be a man, he was made secretary of the Curia, by virtue of the righteousness of his character, then cardinal, and finally pope. One day, when he had ridden on a horse, he gave birth to a child, and immediately, through the Roman courts, he had his feet tied. 
He was pulled by the horse's tail and was stoned by the people for half a league. And where he died, he was buried. And there it is written, Peter, Peter Patrum, Patisse Prodito Partum. Peter, father of the fathers, published the Pope's childbearing. Then it was created the fast of the four times, called the fast of the Popis. I want to note at this point that I don't actually equate um, gender and pronouns. I think you can use whatever pronouns you want, but in terms of uh, linguistically, uh, this was written a particular way that's very interesting. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, I just wanted to be clear that I, I think you can use whatever pronouns you want and that I don't think that he, him, his is necessarily indicative that you are a man. Okay. Um, it is interesting to note that the Latin text uses all the Latin pronouns in the masculine gender through the verbs in the past masculine participle. He was made factus, he was dragged, tractus, he was stoned, lapidatus, um, he was buried, sepultus. Some authors, for the ease of modern readers, have used the pronoun she instead of he, but this is not actually accurate to Maillie's original text. In 1265 CE, an anonymous author, who later became known as the Franciscan of Erfurt, wrote the Chronica Minor, which likely drew inspiration from Jan of Maillie's narrative, but with added further details. There was another false pope, whose name and age are not known, for she was a woman, as it is recognized by the Romans, of refined appearance, of great knowledge, and hypocritically of high conduct. She disguised herself in men's clothing and was elected to papacy. As a popist, she became, she became pregnant, and when she was pregnant, a demon publicly announced the fact to everyone in the public square, shouting this verse, Papa, Peter Patrum, Papise Prodito Partum, Pope, Father of the Fathers, publish the Pope's childbearing. Note the first word in the sentence with the six Ps in the Chronica Universalis is Peter, while in the Chronica Minor it is Papa, Pope. In addition, the sentence with six Ps is engraved on a grave in the first narrative, while in the second narrative it is a phrase spoken aloud by a devil. Jean de Mailly's story became popular amongst other Dominicans, including Stéphane of, Bour of Bourbon, also called Etienne de Bourbon, um, who lived from 1180 CE to 1261 CE, a preacher of the Dominican order and the author of the largest collection of preaching exemplar of the 13th century, and a historian of medieval heresies. Stefan of Bourbon was also one of the first inquisitors. His treatise, Tractatus of Diversis Materis Predicabilibus, um, the treatise on various materials for preaching, which I probably mispronounced, published around 1260 CE, echoed Jean of Mailly's narrative, although it expounded on some details. An impressive blow of audacity, or rather insanity, happened around the year 1100 CE, as it is said in the Chronicles. A certain educated woman, educated in the art of writing, taking on masculine clothes and presenting herself as a man, came to Rome, and having been accepted, both by her energy and her knowledge, was made secretary of the Curia, then, with the aid of the devil, was made cardinal, and then pope. She became pregnant and gave birth when she rode a horse and was dragged out of the city. She was stoned by the people for a league. She was buried where she died, and on the, sta the stone placed on her corpse, this little verse was written, Parse pater patrum papise prodere partum. Avoid, father of the fathers, publishing popish childbearing. See what abhorrent end such bold presumption leads. Again, this narrative agrees on some details and diverges on others. Note, the initial word in the alliterative sentence of the six Ps is now parse, from the verb parsere, which means to abstain from, to save, and to avoid. This account also provided a date, 1100 CE. However, it is the phrase, as it is said in the Chronicles, 
ut dissiter in chronesis, that may be the most important divergent detail. This would imply that there are more records, or at least there were, more chronicles of the female pope other than the Chronica Universalis and the Chronica Minor. Some historians refer to the works of Marianus Scotus, who lived from 1028 CE to 1082 CE, Sigebert of Gembro, um, who lived from 1035 CE to 100 to 1112 CE, Otto of Freising, who lived from 1111 CE to 1158, 1158 CE, Godfrey of Viterbo, who lived from 1120 CE to 1196 CE, and Gervase of Tilbury, who lived from 1150 CE to 1221 CE, as the early chronic as the earlier chronicles referenced in Stefan of Bourbon's account. However, at the time that Stefan of Bourbon was writing, those accounts didn't actually describe a female pope. The references in those works are not in the oldest extant manuscripts by those authors, but rather they're only in the later copies. Some historians argue that since the accounts were added into later copies of the manuscripts, those dating after 1250 CE, that implies that the popus was widely accepted as having existed and that the church had relaxed its aggressive stance on prohibiting any record of her. Or they argue later copies managed to get past censorship by the church, but earlier copies did not. One of those early chronicles predates Jan Pierre of Mai by a not insignificant amount of time, that of Godfrey, the Pantheon of Viterbo, which was written in 1190 CE, and which appears the phrase, Popis Joan is not enumerated. In all 41 surviving manuscript copies of the Pantheon of Viterbo, this phrase appears in only one of them, only one of 41. It is unknown whether this is a single, uncensored copy, or if this was added to the text by a later scribe making the copy who had heard of the Popis, who was noting that she was not on the list given in the Pantheon of Viterbo. If the copies all date to 1190 CE, and only one has this mention in it, then this would actually be deeply significant in proving whether the figure of Pope Joan actually existed or not. Unfortunately, the copies of the manuscript are not precisely dated, and so historians get to argue back and forth. The most popular and influential version of the legend was almost certainly written by the Dominican friar, bishop, and chronicler Martin of Opava, also called Martinus Polonis or Martin Strebsky. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, Strebsky. Um, circa unknown to 1278 CE. His version of the story of Pope Joan appears in the third recension, edited revision, of his Chronicon Pontificum et Imperiatorum, his Chronicle of Popes and Emperors, circa 1265 CE to 1277 CE. Martin's work was so influential that it would later become the primary source of inspiration for basically all subsequent writers who wrote on the subject of Pope Joan. There are a huge amount of surviving manuscript copies, approximately 425, which is like for medieval records, that's enormous, as well as an unusually large number of translations into myriad languages, including but not limited uh, to Czech, French, German, Italian, Spanish, and English. In Martin's version, a name is finally given to the female Pope, although it is not Pope Joan. Instead, the Chronicon calls the figure John Anglicus, or John of Mainz. The Chronicon claimed that she studied in Athens, entered the church to be with her lover, and it also changed the date from the 11th century to the 9th century, placing the female pope between Leo IV and Benedict III in the 850s CE. It also gave the date of the pontificate as uh, 855 CE, the duration of the pontificate, two years, seven months, and four days, and the site of the unexpected birth in a narrow passage between the Colosseum and the Church of St. Clement. 
The narrative is as follows. After Leo, John, an Englishman born in Mainz, occupied the papal throne for two years, seven months, and four days. He died in Rome, and the papacy was vacant for a month. He, as it is stated, was a woman, and when she was still young, she was taken to Athens, dressed as a man by a certain lover. She had progressed so far in the various branches of knowledge that no one was able to match her. She then taught in Rome and had great teachers as her students and auditors. In addition, because her life and her knowledge were esteemed in the city, she was unanimously elected Pope. However, when she exercised her papacy, she became preg pregnant with her lover. Unaware of the moment of childbirth as she was moving from St. Peter's Chapel to the Lateran, she gave birth in a narrow passageway between the Colosseum and the Church of St. Clement, and after her death, it is said she was buried in the same place. Because the Pope avoids that street, it is believed by many that he does so by virtue of the repugnance of that event. He is not included in the, in the catalog of the Holy Pontiffs because of the deformity of the female as to this circumstance, that of governing as Pope. An alternate version of the Chronicon described an alternative fate for the female Pope, claiming that she did not die immediately after her exposure, but rather that she was confined and deposed, after which she did many years of penance. According to this version, her son from the affair eventually became Bishop of Ostia and ordered her entombment in his cathedral when she died. This is definitely a very alternate version and not the one that has become the most common. Note, Martin of Opava flipped back and forth between using he and she as the pronouns for the Pope. There are also turns of phrase that imply Martin of Opava was drawing not just from written account, but from oral records that were passing down simultaneously. As asserted, ut asser iter, and as it is said, ut dissiter, and it is believed by many, creditor a plerisk, plerisk, plerisco? I have no idea how that's supposed to be pronounced. My grandmother would be appalled. Medieval popes from the 13th century onward did actually avoid the direct route between the Lateran and St. Peter's, as Martin of Opava claimed in his story. However, the origin of the practice is uncertain. They do actually do this, but we don't know why. Although there are other references to the female pope that are occasionally attributed to earlier authors, none actually predate the Chronicon. The one most commonly cited as predating the Chronicon is by Anastasius, Bibliothecarius, um, circa unknown to 886 CE, a compiler of Liber Pontificalis, who would have been a contemporary of the female pope by the Chronicon's dating. However, the story is found in only one manuscript of Anastasius. This manuscript, currently in the possession of the Vatican Library, has the relevant passage inserted as a footnote at the bottom of the page and it is out of sequence and in a different hand, one that almost certainly dates to after the time of Martin of Opava. Thus it could not have been a source for Martin of Opava. I apologize for the cat whining in the background. <laughs> Over time, the text of Martin of Opava became the accepted canonical version of the history of Pope Joan. Thomas F.X. Noble stated on this Literally, countless later authors have simply appropriated the Martinus version of the history of the Popus Joan. Ironically, when several authors of the 16th and 17th centuries CE compiled extensive lists of authors who confirmed the truth of the story, they failed to mention or did not realize that those authors were merely repeating, almost literally, the account of Martinus. The 1910 Catholic Encyclopedia went into detail disputing Martin of Opava's account, here called Martinus Polonus. Between Leo IV and Benedict III, where Martinus Polonus places her, she cannot be inserted because Leo IV died on the 17th of July, 855. And immediately after his death, Benedict III was elected by the clergy and people of Rome. But owing to the setting up of an antipope in the person of the deposed Cardinal Anastasius, he was not consecrated until 29th of September. Coins exist which bear both the image of Benedict III and of Emperor Lothar, who died 28th September 855. Therefore, Benedict must have been recognized as pope before the last mentioned date. 
On the 7th of October 855, Benedict III issued the charter for the Abbey of Corvey. Hink Hinkmar, Archbishop of Rheims, informed Nicholas I that a messenger whom he had sent to Leo IV learned on his way of the death of this pope and therefore handed his petition to Benedict III, who decided it. All these witnesses proved the correctness of the dates given in the lives of Leo IV and Benedict III, and there was no interregnum between these two popes, so that at this place there is no room for the alleged popus. After Martin of Opava's account was written, the story of Pope Joan was widely distributed and widely believed to be true. Even Petrarch, 1304 CE to 1374 CE wrote about Pope Joan in his Chronica della Vitae de Pontifici et Imperadori Romani, claiming that after Pope Joan had been revealed as a woman, in Brescia it rained blood for three days and nights. In France there appeared marvelous locusts, who, which had six wings and very powerful teeth. They flew miraculously through the air and all drowned in the British Sea. The golden bodies were rejected by the waves of the sea and corrupted the air so that a great many people died. Although it should be noted that the attribution of this work to Petrarch may be incorrect. The story appeared in sermons, chronicles, etc., often as a moralizing account used to teach a lesson, such as in the preaching of Bartolomea Platina, 1421 CE to 1881 CE, also known as Platina, a humanist author and scholar who was prefect of the Vatican Library, who wrote in his Vitae Pontificum Platinae Historici Liber de Vitae Christi ac Omnium Pontificum qui hactinus ducenti fuere et uh, 20 in 1479 at the behest of his patron, Pope Sixtus IV, which I also probably mispronounced. Pope John VIII, John of English extraction, was born at Mentz, and it was said to have arrived, and is said to have arrived at popedom by evil art, for disguising herself like a man, whereas she was a woman, she went when young with her paramour, a learned man, to Athens, and made such progress in learning under the professors there that, coming to Rome, she met with few that could equal, much less go beyond her, even in the knowledge of the scriptures. And by her learned and ingenious readings and disputations, she acquired so great respect and authority that upon the death of Pope Leo IV, as Martin says, by common consent, she was chosen Pope in his room. As she was going to the Lateran, the Lateran Church between the Colosseum Theater, so-called from Nero's Colossus, and St. Clement's, her travail came upon her, and she died upon the place, having sat two years, one month, and four days, and was buried there without any pomp. This story is vulgarly told, but by very uncertain and obscure authors, and therefore I have related it barely and in short, lest I should seem obstinate and pertinacious, if I had admitted what is so generally talked. I had better mistake with the rest of the world, though it be certain, that what I have related may be thought not altogether incredible. Not only do references to the female pope abound throughout the later medieval era and into the Renaissance, there are also references to statues. The Chronicon of Adam of Usk from, the 14 of, from 1404 CE, which refers to the female pope as Agnes, cited the existence of a statue in Rome that is said to be of the female pope. In the late 14th century, a long series of busts of the popes was made for the Duomo of Siena and included the female pope, named Johannes VIII, Foima de Anglia, and placed between the busts of Leo IV and Benedict III. Another interesting account found in the late 14th century version of the Mirabilia Urbis Romae, a guidebook for pilgrims to Rome, says the remains of the female pope are buried at St. Peter's. At his trial in 1415 CE, the Czech theologian and historian and martyr Jan Hus, circa 1372 CE to 1415 CE, argued that the church didn't need a pope, as during the pontificate of the female pope, who he called Pope Agnes, it got on quite well without one. It is interesting to note that the opponents at his trial didn't, didn't try to uh, prove one way or another whether the church needed a pope. 
but they also did not dispute the existence of a female pope at all. During the trial of Jan Hus, it was just accepted that there had been in the 16th century, historians began debating the existence of Pope Joan and trying to, disprove, to disprove her existence as an actual verifiable human figure. Various authors and scholars um, published their attempts to deconstruct and disprove all of the accounts. In 1601 CE, Pope Clement VIII declared that there was and never had been any female Pope and that the legend was untrue. The aforementioned bust in Duomo di Siena was destroyed or recarved and possibly even relabeled, replaced by a male figure, that of Pope Zachary. During the Reformation, Protestant authors actually argued in favor of a historical Pope Joan, but they did so as a form of anti-Catholic propaganda, basically like, ooh, they had a female Pope and there was this scandal. How gross, as if the idea of the female pope, like a female leader of the church, was so repugnant. Not that it hugely matters to the legend as it affects the papis or popis or high priestess card, but it is also of some historical interest that some versions of the legend of Pope Joan claim that all subsequent popes had to be subjected to an examination whereby, upon being sat on a special called a sedia stracoraria, or dung chair, containing a hole, a cardinal would reach up and establish that any new pope had testicles. The cardinal would then announce, duos habet et vene pendentes. He has two, and they dangle nicely. I want to pause here and note that the TV show The Borgias, which is currently available on Netflix, actually shows this scene, um, like portrays it as part of their mythical history of the Borgia family and the Borgia papacy. But it was just really funny because I literally wrote this and then was watching the Borgias and I was like, hey, there are in fact surviving antique versions of these chairs, one in the Vatican Museum and another at the Musée de Louvre. Um, however, the reason that popes owned them is somewhat disputed. Some historians claim that these were actually Roman bidets or imperial birthing stools, which because of their age and imperial links were used in ceremonies by popes who were intent on highlighting their own imperial importance, wealth, and ties to ancient Rome. Remember that uh, during this time period, everybody wanted to be very Roman and they wanted to be like, no, we have ties to ancient Rome. Um, and they didn't want to be seen as having been from anywhere else. This was actually one of the reasons why the Borgia papacy was opposed, not just because of his um, reputation, but because he wasn't Roman. Anyway, there is also a known instance of the poor counting of popes, specifically in the 11th century, Pope John the, I think that's the 14th, Pope John the 14th was mistakenly counted as being two popes. When Petrus Hispanus was elected pope in 1276 CE, he believed that there had already been 20 popes named John, so he numbered himself John the 21st, skipping John the 20th. This apparent missing Pope John is sometimes believed to be the missing Pope Joan. In actuality, Petrus Hispanus misread an unclear entry in the Liber Pontificalis, wherein the period of John XIV's reign, eight months, had an appended second entry for his imprisonment at the hands of the antipope Boniface VII for a duration of four months. Believing that this referred to an actual historical personage, whom he referred to as Pope John XIV, um, John the 21st decided to correct what he thought was an error on the part of his predecessors and incremented the number of his name to accommodate. An archaeological argument for the existence of Pope Joan as Pope John the Eighth was put forward in 2018 by Michael E. Habicht, an archaeologist at Flinders University. He worked with grapho analyst Marguerite Spiker to analyze the papal monograms of medieval coins and found two significantly different monograms attributed to Pope John VIII, one from the period between 856 to 858 CE and one after 875 CE. Note the intervening years are not mentioned. Habicht argued that the former monogram belongs to Pope Joan and that the latter belongs to a second Pope John VIII after the church excised all record of Pope Joan. With all that being recounted, it's actually kind of doubtful 
that early Taroki players would have looked at the imagery on the cards and seen Pope Joan. We actually have artwork of Pope Joan surviving from medieval records, and in it, um, she's not always very positively portrayed. Pope Joan is portrayed kind of um, terribly actually. So generally nursing an infant or with an infant tumbling or peeping sneakily out from under papal robes. The depictions are often uncouth, they're lurid, and they're designed to provoke a negative reaction, whereas the image of the papist on the card is actually regal and powerful, which gives more credence to other theories. So uh, what are the other theories? There are two other figures that the Papist card is sometimes said to represent. One, Guglielma, I'm about to get into, and one is Visconti Sforza's cousin. And one of the issues with breaking this down historically is that a lot of the evidence that would support one actually supports the other as well. Basically, all the evidence that would say that it might be Guglielma also can kind of support it being Mifreda, um, which I'm going to get into now. I also just want to note at this point that I am sorry how long this video is going to turn out to be. Lots of long videos lately. I'll have to do a short rant. In approximately 1260 CE, a middle-aged woman named Guglielma of Bohemia appeared in Milan accompanied by a grown son. Little is known of her origins, although one contemporary said she was from England and she was said to have claimed to be the daughter of Premisil Otakar, King of Bohemia. She quickly gained a following as a preacher. She wore a simple brown habit and lived the life of a saint. She performed miracles, exhibited stigmata, and was a renowned healer, although she vehemently denied that she was in any way divine. When she died in 1281 CE, her body was placed in the Cistercerian house at Chiaravalle. Eventually, a cult grew up around her relics, claiming that miracles had occurred. During the reign of Pope Boniface VIII from 1244 CE to 1303 CE, Guglielma's following claimed that she was an incarnation of the Holy Spirit. They said she would eventually revive and overthrow the papacy and inaugurate the age of the Holy Spirit as foretold by Joachim of Fiore, in, who lived from circa 1135 CE to 1202 CE, also known as Joachim of Flora and in Italian as Ionacchio de Fiore. I don't think I'm pronouncing any of that correctly, but I want to move on. An Italian Christian theologian, Catholic abbot, and the founder of the monastic order of San Giovanni in Fiore, who made apocalyptic predictions. This new age was meant to be heralding the inauguration of the Ecclesia Spiritualis, in which grace, spiritual knowledge, and contemplative gifts would be diffused to all. The followers of Joachim um, had expected the Age of the Holy Spirit in 1260 CE, so if it was to be found in Guglielma, it was running a bit late. Immediately after Guglielma's death, dozens of portraits were painted and chapels were dedicated to the new Saint Guglielma. The cross of Guglielma is said to be visible on the Visconti Sforza Papist card, which I'll get into a little more later. It is possible, it is, that the Papist card contains a sneaky image of Guglielma. It's also possible that it contains an image of Maifreda, Visconti da Pirovano. The followers of Guglielma later decided that a young Milanese woman named Maifreda di Pirovano, also called Manfreda, Visconti da Pirovano, was meant to be the new pope. They believed that she had been chosen by Guglielma herself and that at the Pentecost of 1300 CE, Guglielma would somehow install her on the papal throne from beyond the grave. Maifreda and a priest, Andrea Saramita, both members of the Umiliati religious order, of which Maifreda was an abbess, promoted the idea that Guglielma was the incarnation of a feminine, Christ-like Holy Spirit, and gathered a following of both men and women to support a new papacy, one where there would be a female pope. 
In preparation for the new papacy, Maifreda began to celebrate Mass amongst her disciples. Plans were made for a new college of cardinals that would be made up either entirely or mostly by women. Unfortunately, the religious authorities at the time did not look kindly on uh, this movement. And so the entire sect of the Gugliamites, including Maifreda and Saramita, were burned at the stake in 1300 CE. Guglielma's body was also dug up and burned, even though the only testimony given against her during the trial of the Gugliamites and the Umiliati was that she had appeared in her followers' dreams and visions after her death, promoting heresy. A decade later, while investigating the head of the ruling Visconti family on charges of heresy, church authorities emphasized the fact that Maifreda was a cousin of the Visconti family. Maifreda was first cousin to Matteo Visconti. The Ghibelline, which is anti-pope, like opposed papal authority, ruler of Milan. It was this family which, two centuries later, commissioned the very first tarot decks, which I will go into in depth, like really, really in depth, in our upcoming series, The Timeline of the History of the Tarot, which is a refilming of our previous series, The Timeline of the History of the Tarot. Sorry. Um, the deck commissioned by the family from Bonifacio Bembo was the first to include a figure resembling a female pope, although the card is actually unlabeled, it's not named. I want to note here, I found a couple of people claiming that there was actually an earlier deck produced by um, one of the Ferreras, uh, which is being referred to as the Estes deck. I went looking and that does not match the dates of any of the Estes decks that I could find. However, I do find a couple people referencing that. I just want to note that Matteo Visconti's son, Galeazzo, married the Duke of Ferrara's sister in 1300 CE um, and lived in Ferrara from 1302 CE to 1310 CE. And um, Guglielma's legend and veneration as a myth figure were exceedingly popular in Ferrara during this time period, especially so after a hagiography of Guglielma was written by the well-known miracle playwright Antonio Tanini Pulci, um, and that was published by Antonio Bonfadini. I will get into more of that miracle play um, in a little bit, but I just want to say, like, even if the Estes deck exists, as, as I'm seeing some historians online say it does, and even if it does um, somehow slightly predate the Visconti Sforza deck, um, which I don't necessarily agree that it does, um, it doesn't actually rule out the associations thereof because the Visconti form Forza family and the Ferrara family were both part of the interdiction of Milan and accusations against this family, and I'm not... Anyway, I'm gonna keep going because we're already almost at an hour and there's more information to cover. Matteo Visconti had an advisor who was a devout follower of the cult of Guglielma, Francesco de Garbagnate. It is also important to note that Matteo adamantly opposed the Pope and had a very long, bitter battle with the church. He expelled papal inquisitors from Milan in 1311 CE. Then, in an attempt to limit imperial influence over northern Italy, Pope John the Twenty Second declared a papal bull in 1317 CE titled Cifretum, that anyone who claimed to be an imperial vicar without the consent of the Pope would be excommunicated. This bull was specifically directed at Matteo Visconti, um, Congranda della Scala in Verona, and Este in Ferrara, who we just mentioned in that side note. Rather than back down, Matteo took the title General Lord of the Milanese people. After some limited attempts to come to peaceful terms, the Pope appointed Icardio Camodea, a Franciscan, as Archbishop of Milan. In 1320 CE at Avignon, Pope John XXII raised the charge of necromancy against Matteo, claiming that he had tried to cause the death of the Pope with the complicity of Dante Algieri. Yes. That Dante. Uh, the bull concluded about Matteo, 
um, which is found in Henry Charles Lea, A History of the Inquisition of the Middle Ages. His enormous crimes show that he is an offshoot of heresy, his ancestors having been suspect and some of them burned, and he has for officials and confidants heretics, such as Francesco Garbanate, on whom crosses have been imposed. He has expelled the Inquisition from Florence. This should actually be Milan, I think. He interposed in favor of Maifreda, who was burned. He is an invoker of demons, seeking from them advice and responses. He denies the resurrection of the flesh. He has endured papal excommunication for more than three years, and when cited for examination into his faith, he refused to appear. Um, I want to note that they literally say that he actually tried to save Maifreda, that he tried to interfere in her favor. Matteo refused to travel to the papal city to be tried, citing his age and the precarious state of health, and within a month the court convicted Matteo in absentia of necromancy. Later that year, in December, the Pope asked his appointee, the de jure Archbishop of Milan, to charge Matteo and his son, Galeazzo, with heresy. Archbishop Commodea judged them as heretics, condemned Matteo, and ordered the confiscation of his property and the vacating of all of his offices. From the condemnation records in Latin, here translated by tarot historian Matthew S. Brown, which he found in Le Process de Matteo et de Galeazzo Visconti from Melanges de Archaeologie de et de Histoire, um, volume 29, written in 1909 CE, deposes that during the trial against Maifreda and her heresy, many things would have been said and discovered against the faith if they had not been dismissed for fear of Matteo, who then ruled Milan. They were not disclosed because those who knew them did not dare reveal them for fear of Matteo. Deposes that it was heard that Matteo requested on behalf of certain disgraced members of the sect of the time of the trial against Manfreda burnt for heresy. Disposes deposes that Matteo, then ruler of Milan, requested for Guido Stanfurio, who was accused and suspected of the heresy of Manfreda or Guglielma, that he be liberated at his request. Of the resurrection and divine providence that he does not believe in the resurrection, nor divine providence concerning human activity. Deposes that from Matteo was heard that when a man dies, his soul goes where it goes, and never resurrects with its body at judgment, and of glory above this that Matteo's mother was of the family of Maifreda, a female heretic burnt, that Matteo asked for the liberation of the female heretic Maifreda, now arrested and handed over to the secular court, that he had a sister of his father or grandfather named Garofola married to the Count of Curtanova, who received and believed heretics, whose castle was completely destroyed by inquisitors, that in his domain he had, he had counselors and secretaries and successfully promoted those suspected and noted of heresy, namely Count Otolinum Curtinova, his cousin, who denied purgatory, that the clergy have imagined, saying it for gain, and again Francesco Garbonet, who was of said sect of Maifreda, and because of this marked with crosses, that in many times and in many places he has impeded with heretical wickedness the duty of the inquisitors by himself or through his office or officials. That he was of the sect of Maifreda, the female heretic, and was condemned by the inquisitors, deposes that was heard from a brother Pezzolo converted to the order of the hermits, who had been a doorkeeper of said hermits, that Gal Galeazzo frequently went with others to the house of the so-called Maifred, who would have condemned because of their error, the brother Pizzolo himself, doorkeeper, witness, under who deposes that it was heard when the error was detected of the so-called Maifred, that Galeazzo would have been marked with a cross, except that Matteo, his father, went to the feet of an inquisitor with a strap at his neck to spare him. In early 1322 CE, the papal legate, Cardinal Bertrand de Puget, um, engaged in combat against those convicted of heresy in Lombardy and proclaimed from Asti a holy crusade against the Visconti family, bringing together the crusaders at Valenza. Eventually, the accusation of heresy was extended to all of Matteo's children. Summons were sent to the allies of the Visconti of Milan, and the citizens themselves were threatened by the Inquisition. Milan was placed under interdiction. In the end of May, 1322 CE, Matteo ceded power to his son Galeazzo and retired. A month later, Matteo died at the age of 71 and was buried in unconsecrated ground. After Matteo's death, the Pope escalated by launching a military attack in addition to the standing interdiction. 
This was defeated and the interdiction was removed in the next decade by a new pope. And in 1341 CE, Pope Benedict the 12th. Um, and in 1341 CE, Pope Benedict the 12th canceled all previous condemnations of the family. However, in the ensuing decades, Bernabo Visconti was condemned twice as a heretic by Pope Urban V, once in 1361 CE, forgiven in 1364 CE, and again in 1373 CE. It is additionally interesting to note that Matteo's grandmother and uncle, the Archbishop of Milan, had earlier also been named heretics. Another interesting element to the evidence one way or another occurs later in the timeline, during the creation of the aforementioned Visconti Sforza deck that was commissioned by the Visconti family. Between 1440 CE and 1460 CE, Bianca Maria Visconti, the wife of Francesco Sforza and Duchess of Milan, the marriage of these two may have been why the Visconti Sforza deck was created, was a frequent visitor of Maddalena Albrizzi, the abbess of monasteries in Como and Brunate. She frequently gave aid and gifts to the order. The Como monastery was actually built with stones that were donated by Francesco Sforza. Around 1450 CE, the same period as the deck was commissioned, a cycle of frescoes was painted in the church of San Andrea at Brunate that recorded the story of Guglielma. How she left the house of her husband, came to Brunate, and lived a solitary life here, wearing a hair shirt and ordinary dress in the company of a crucifix and an image of Our Lady. Only one of these frescoes survives to the current day, still ornately framed in the original chapel dedicated to St. Guglielma. The fresco depicted Guglielma with two figures kneeling in front of her, one of whom is a nun whom she appears to be blessing. It is possible that the two figures are Maifreda and Andrea Saramita, although it, also, it is also possible that the figures are Madalena Albrizzi, the founder of the monastery and candidate for sainthood, and her cousin Pietra Albrisi, who paid for the renovations of the church. We do know the church was almost certainly a place of worship for Guglielma, as even as late as the 19th century, Sir Richard Burton, author of the Arabian Nights, noted that Santa Guglielma, worshipped at Brunate, works many miracles, chiefly healing aches of the head. So basically, we have a family that opposes papal authority, that lost the trial about their heresy, building churches to honor Guglielma, related to Guglielma's spiritual heir, Maifreda, designing with Bonifacio Bembo the tarot deck that depicts the papists. In the so-called Age of the Holy Spirit, a medieval Christian movement that was almost entirely female-led, with a following that was of mixed gender, but so predominantly female, it would actually be considered completely normal or right for a woman to rule the church. But there is no reason that woman would be called Pope. One explanation given for this flaw in the legend is that by the time of Mayfreda, the story of Pope Joan was well known, and so it may have been that the followers of Mayfreda nothing out of ordinary with a female pope. Many of the historians covering whether or not the papist depicts Guglielma or Mayfreda describe that the brown robes depicted on the figure are the robes of the Umiliati tertiaries, the name of their lay associates. However, the tertiaries of the Franciscans also wore something very similar to what is depicted on the papist. However, Andrea Visconti, the master general of the Umiliati order, was Maria Bianchi Visconti's godfather and also her stand-in at the marriage contract drawn up between Filippo Visconti and Sforza. The Franciscans in Milan were aligned with the Umiliati against the Dominicans, and both the Franciscans and the Umiliati were connected with the Age of the Holy Ghost movement. However, there is another possibility that the card depicts Agnes of the Poor Claris and the tertiaries of the Franciscans. That we'll cover next time. It is argued that the papess is wearing the three knotted waist cord of the poor Claris uh, female Franciscans. However, the papess is depicted with four knots on her cord, although one has a scratch through it and so may have been a mistake that the artist attempted to remove. If the image is meant to show three knots, they might depict the three vows of the Franciscans, obedience, poverty, and chastity. 
However, there is also a reference to the three knots in the Inquisition's trial of the, Guglia, of the Gugliamites and Mifreda. The Italian record by Marco Mendes Valesi is here translated again by Michael S. Howard of the Letaro Cultural Association. In this room, in the presence of all the summoned people, Sister Maifreda said that, uh, that the Lady St. Guglielma had ordained the Sister Maifreda to say to all those present that she was the Holy Spirit, true God and true man, and that hence all the aforesaid there present would not have appeared in her presence otherwise. Added the aforementioned Sister Maifreda, let be for me what can be. Elagranza also said to remember that the above-mentioned lady Carabella in that house then sat on her own habit, and when she got up, she found that the belt or cord of her habit had made three knots that had not been there, and there grew around them, then marveling and whispering among them, and many from this same testimony believed it to be a great miracle. So the three knots are actually associated with Guglielma and Maifreda as well. The minutes from the Inquisition into the followers of Guglielma also recorded that Maifreda and the other Guglielmites wore habits that were morello in color. Guglielma, it is said, wore habits that were more morone, nut brown, chestnut, and moretto, brown, dark, or brunette. Some historians have argued that this means the Pathos card is wearing too light brown of a habit to be either Maifreda or Guglielma. However, neither Morello nor Moretto mean that the robes have to be dark brown. However, even if they did mean the robes needed to be dark brown, that doesn't actually rule out that the card is an accurate depiction of Guglielma or Maifreda. Monica Dox, a professor of art history at the University of Vienna who specializes in Italian drawing of the late Middle Ages, proposed in 1992 that the cards created by Bonifacio Bembo um, were touched up later by a different artist, likely the same one that did six of the surviving cards, likely when the originals were damaged. Perhaps the light brown was painted over darker brown robes. Felesi cited the existence of a copy of the original card that survives to this day, held at the Fourier Museum, wherein the figure is wearing the dark brown robes that some people insist were possibly worn by Guglielma. Historian Gertrude Mopley claimed that the Visconti commissioners of the Papist card knew of these statements in the Inquisition and created the card accordingly. Before getting into why or why not they would have had access to the records, I would just like to note that they would likely not have had to have records of the Inquisition to know what colors the Guglielmites wore, as the Guglielmites still existed when the card was commissioned and depictions of Guglielma were exceedingly common. No record of the Inquisition has been found in Rome or Avignon, and the records of the Lombardy Inquisition were destroyed in 1788 CE. However, an abridged version was found in a grocery shop in Pavia in the 17th century, which is the source of the details given regarding the habits. The record was found by Matteo Valerio, unknown to 1645 CE, the Carthusian prior of Pavia, who then gave it to the historian Giovanni Puricelli. It now resides in the Biblioteca Ambrosiana. Whew. Couple other possible inspirations. Some historians theorize that the Papists may be depicting a St. Clair of the Poor Clares, the female branch of the Franciscan. And I don't actually know if this is supposed to be pronounced Claris or Clares, and I probably should have looked that up before I made this video, but I didn't. So I've just been kind of using those pronunciations interchangeably. And I'm now an hour and 12 minutes into recording it, and I'm not going back and starting over. As it is visible in the circa 1450, 45 painting by the Neapolitan artist Niccolo Antonio Colantonio, Delivery of Franciscan Rule, the poor Claris wore black hoods, while the tertiaries had the same white top and light brown habit as the popus. So could the papus or popus or high priestess be a poor Claire sister instead? There is a legend popular in Lombardy since the early 1300s CE that Guglielmo was actually Villamina, the daughter of the king and queen of Bohemia. The real Villamina, whether or not she was also Guglielma, had a younger sister who became St. Agnes after establishing an order of poor Claris in Prague with the help of St. Clair of Assisi. Um, perhaps this was a sneaky way the Viscontis could honor Guglielma or Maifreda by showing St. Agnes instead. It is, of course, also possible that the image depicts one of the poor Claris because 
I think it actually probably is poor Claire's. I've been kind of thinking about it. Poor Claire's. Because of their reputation for humility and simplicity, and so the card was meant to represent those virtues. Okay, that was a lot of information. That was a lot of information. But I just want to sum up, even though we're like over an hour. Sorry. The Visconti and Sforza families are basically responsible for tarot imagery as we know it because of Bonifacio Bembo and the cards that they commissioned. You can actually buy a Visconti Sforza tarot reproduction deck and it's what I used for many, 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 many years um, because I'm a tarot historian as much as I am a tarot reader. They absolutely opposed papal authority and they were part of this whole uh, Gugliamite, Umiliati, Age of the Holy Spirit, anti-Pope movement. Um, it's entirely possible that along with potentially commissioning a person with dwarfism to use necromancy to kill the Pope, which is a rant for another day, um, uh, kind of an amazing rant in the history of witchcraft, um, actually really the history of necromancy. Um, let me know if you want that rant, because I'd be happy to film it. Um, in addition to, you know, trying to kill the Pope with ne necromancy, which the Viscontis may or may not have done, they definitely supported this movement, and they kept chapels dedicated to the worship of Guglielma, and they definitely mourned for the loss of Maifreda, and apparently tried to intercede on her behalf and failed. And the fact that they did so was used against them in their own trials for heresy. So could they have potentially used the imagery that was common in their area at the time of a Gugliamite or Umiliati female personage, either Guglielma or Maifreda, as inspiration for this card? Yeah, absolutely. And it would be in character for them, considering the images, the frescoes that they may have paid for in another chapel. Um, but is there any proof that they absolutely positively did so? No. Um, so do I have a theory as to whether or not the card is Pope Joan or the card is Guglielma or the card is Maifreda? Kind of. I'm, I'm a little invested in one theory over the other, but not to the point that I would swear to it. There's just not enough evidence for or against. But I've given you all the evidence that I have, so I'm interested to hear what you think. Tell me in the comments below, do you think that the Popus is actually St. Joan, Guglielma, uh, Maifreda, um you know, one of the other Franciscan order, so either St. Agnes or one of the other of the order of St. Clair. Um, or do you think it's an allegory, like other personifications that were common at the time? Speaking of which, that is where we will pick up next time, where we will go in depth into the High Priestess card the way we normally do, not with an hour long debate. Um, going into how the card's been portrayed and interpreted through time, and then how I interpret it, um, both upright and reversed, um, for past, present, future, love, career, etc. Um, I will try and remember to link to that up here once it's actually filmed, but, you know, I'll probably forget. Anyway, thank you all for tuning in, and, um sticking with me through this very long and very dense video and I hope you all stay safe out there.